Just this morning, I stopped at a convenience store on the way here. The front door had uh, almost like wallpaper <laughs> signs up on the front entryway. We don't have any gas. We don't know when we're going to get it. I went in and bought a newspaper, and bless her heart, the attendant looked at me, and before I even said anything, she said, we don't have any gas. <laughs> yeah. What a week, huh? What a week. I'm grateful that you're here. I'm grateful that you're in a place where you can receive some energy. I thought it's too late to do it. I wish I'd had the idea earlier. We sh should have put on the marquee out here. We'll fill you up. <laughs> that would have been good, huh? You know, Jesus was Lord before the storm. He's Lord in the storm. He's the Lord after the storm. Amen. Amen. And so my heavenly Father, our blessed Jesus, our King, our King, our King, we bow before you as our Lord. Our hearts are just so full of a variety of emotions, from fear to hurt to shock to numbness. We, we don't know how to process what we're seeing. We're feeling even some guilt. Here we are, high and dry, with people we love just by virtue of a, of a street address have lost their homes and their cars and their belongings. Even a few have lost their lives. So we ask you, dearest Father, to help us understand just a little bit how we're supposed to process this, what we're supposed to do with it. We thank you, Jesus, that you walk in the middle of storms to rescue disciples and to display your glory. And we pray that you will do that now. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, so today's paper looks like this. Did you ever think you'd see anything? 12,600 homes destroyed, 42,399 evacuees in shelters. 42,000. That's four times the size of my little hometown where I grew up. And then 50 fatalities confirmed. What is the gospel according to Harvey? What can we learn from this? Who would have ever imagined that we would see roadways turned into rivers, that we would see uh, rescuers in flat-bottomed boats paddling through neighborhoods? Who would have ever thought we'd see the, the hero of the day or rednecks in their big trucks? <laughs> Riding in in camouflage, rescuing people. I'd never even heard of the Cajun Navy. <laughs> and some of the images that we saw and are seeing, right? Uh, the elderly in the rest home or senior citizen home, chest deep in water. The sights of families returning to see their homes for the first time and as one man said somewhere down in there there's a 150 year old family bible just image after image and now the economic ramifications of cars destroyed and homes destroyed and people dislocated and for days we've watched this tragedy unfold and if you're like me you've wrestled with feelings of disbelief and numbness and fear Maybe you've even had the thought that I've had. It seems to me we're feeling these feelings and seeing these sights far too often. I was thumbing through some old sermons on Monday, and I came across one, for crying out loud, that was preached almost exactly 12 years ago today, almost September 10th, 2005. The headline or the, the title of the sermon was Lessons from Katrina. And then we had one, Lessons from Haiti. What we can learn from 9-11. It seems like we're just stacking them up. One calamity after another. What can we learn from these? I think it's very important for us as God's people to pause and say, Lord, are you trying to get our attention? 
Are you trying to say something to us? Do we need to be hearing something more than what is in the news coverage? Are there some spiritual lessons that we should take from this that will make us better people and better servants? Jesus was critical of the leaders of his day because they focused on the weather and ignored the signals. He said, you find it easy enough to forecast the weather. Why can't you read the signs of the times? So, Lord, what are the signs of the times? What are we needing to see as your followers, as your people? Are there some spiritual lessons that you would like us to learn? Well, I would imagine if we all made a list, that list could grow very long. Mine got very long very quickly. I reduced it down to four. I'll see if we can get through these on time. Number one, stuff doesn't last, but relationships do. Stuff doesn't last, but relationships do. You've noticed, as I have, as people are uh, responding to the tragedy, that you're not seeing anybody scream, I can't find my cordless drill. I've lost my plasma television. People aren't even weeping over submerged SUVs. But if they're weeping, it's for people. It's for relationships. If they're rejoicing, it's for relationships. It's for people. Could it be that Jesus is giving us yet another reminder as we, the wealthiest nation on earth, need to be reminded that it's not possessions that matter, but it's people that matter? Could it be that Jesus is saying, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. We see demolished cars that will never be driven again hidden in debris or buried in water, and in the background of our minds, can we not hear Jesus remind us what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Raging hurricanes and swollen bayous have a way of prying our fingers off of things that will pass, and what once was forgotten now is precious. What was precious is easily forgotten. The Apostle Paul said, tell those who are rich in this world, I'm sorry, tell those who are rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God who piles on the riches, all the riches that we could ever imagine, and to do good and to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Let's let Harvey teach us a lesson. Possessions will pass, but relationships won't. It's relationships that matter. Let Harvey remind you Value your marriage. Treasure your children. Forgive your enemy. Be restored with your adversary. Seek to pursue these relationships because these relationships are what matters. Be assured that possessions pass, but relationships with people That's where it matters. And also be assured, I think, a second point, and that is this. We really are in this together. We really are in this together. We saw and are seeing how humanity can come together and help each other. Lifeboats did not discriminate according to the color of skin. Rescuers did not ask if the person needing to be rescued was a Republican or a Democrat. Helicopter rescue wasn't only offered to people of a particular political persuasion or economic status. People came together to help people. And we need to keep it up, don't we? We need to keep it up. The primary response is prayer. The secondary response is financial help. We would encourage you, if you're looking to partner or to help or to to make financial donations, we would encourage you to go to the American Red Cross or to Samaritan's Purse. In those two organizations, we've put the links in this weekend's handout. If you'd like to give your gift through the Oak Hills Church, you can bet your sweet September we'll put it to good use. We already have people 
on site. James Massey, who heads up our short-term mission program, is already on site in southeast Texas, looking out, scouting out the best opportunity for us to send in teams. We're waiting for the emergency rescuers to do their part. We don't want to get in their way. But at the appropriate time, it will be right for us to send in people with brooms and hammers who are ready to clean up and build. And so if you'd like to make a contribution, we, will cre- we are creating a fund that will help support that type of effort. And you can be sure you'll be given opportunities to volunteer to be a part of those teams. If you do give through the Oak Hills Church, make sure and indicate that on your check that this is for disaster relief or it's for Hurricane Harvey somehow so it won't go into the general fund. If you give online, you'll notice that there is a disaster relief fund button you can click. If you give cash, just put money in an envelope and write Harvey on the envelope. We're also partnering with Community Bible Church. They're collecting uh, and distributing cases of water, collecting them today. And if you'd like to take some cases of water over to the Community Bible Campus on 281, those are going to be collected all day long and then distributed. They're also, and we are also partnering with them in collecting gift cards from like HEB or Target or Walmart. If you want to buy some gift cards and take them over to the Community Bible Campus on 281, those will be distributed this week. Thank you in advance for being the hands and feet of Christ because now is the opportunity, right, for us to rally and bring support to people that we know and people who we don't. But can I also remind you, you don't need a hurricane to help people. And you don't need to go to Southeast Texas to help people. Let this hurricane remind us that there are people who are passing through a storm and it's not on anybody's weather map. Maybe these people are on your street. Maybe these people are in your school. Remember, we're kicking off a a, a series of lessons called Unshakable Hope. And we have several hundred, I think it's up to 250 group leaders now who are ready and poised to help people go through the a study in Scripture, the promises of the Bible, because we're wanting to build our lives not on the pain of life or the problems of life, but on the promises of God. But to do this, we need to know the promises of Scripture. And so we have this series of lessons that we're going to be working through beginning next weekend. Maybe you know somebody at your work or in your school or in your neighborhood who could benefit from being encouraged. We have people desperate for hope. And may the Lord use us to introduce them to unshakable hope. And you can find at the Oak Hills website a banner that will give you details about material, about lessons, about groups, everything you need. And if you don't find it, you just call us. We'll help you. I think it's important for us to remember that we are all in this together. I also think it's important for us to just pause and say out loud, this world doesn't work, but the next one will. This world doesn't work. It just doesn't seem right that there be hurricanes, right? It just doesn't seem right that there be tornadoes. It just doesn't seem right. Something is off. It's awry. It doesn't seem right. And the resounding amen you hear from Scripture is, yes, it is not working. It doesn't work. And Scripture tells us over and over, uh, passages like this one from Romans 8 and verse 22, the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. What an image. It's as if the whole creation is third trimester heavy, waiting to deliver. Now, I cannot speak from experience about these birth pains, but I've been told that they are not very comfortable. I have been told that they can be very painful, but I have also been told that as they increase in frequency, you're drawing closer and closer to delivery. Is that correct? The more intense they become, the more frequently they come, the closer and closer you are to delivery. Am I the only one who seems to to think that, boy, we're having a lot of these? I mean, they just seem to be stacking up. We just, we've not even endured one hurricane, and there's another one coming our way. 
Could it be that the Lord is reminding us that we're getting closer and closer and closer to the very end of this era and we're going to witness the birth, the new birth of a new day? Could it be that this is the generation that will see the return of Christ? Could it be that what this message is, is not, amen, if you want to applaud the Lord there. Could it be that we need to be reminded as we look at these hurricanes, yeah, this isn't how it was going to be, but it's going to be the way God intended for it to be. And we're getting closer and closer to that day. This world is not as how it was, but God will restore it. The promise of Scripture is that God will reclaim his creation. He will have his garden of Eden, and he will lay hold of every atom, emotion, insect, animal, and galaxy and he will lay hold of every diseased body, every afflicted mind, every polluted piece of dirt. He is a God of restoration. Look at this promise that Jesus gives us from Matthew chapter 19. He says, in the recreation of the world, look at that phrase, there is coming a recreation of the world. When the Son of Man will rule gloriously, you who have followed me will also rule there is coming a recreation of the world, a restoration of the world, a renewal, a redemption, a regeneration, a resurrection. God is a builder at heart. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare. Look at him. He's a carpenter. He's preparing a place. He's preparing a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there may, you may be also. I do not know how a person can process the storm like we're seeing without the hope of heaven. I do not know. I do not know how a person can process a nature that seems so out of whack without the promise that nature will be restored to its intended state. But God has promised that if we set our eyes on heaven, that will give us strength to endure these storms. Do that, will you? Do that, will you? Do not let your understanding be limited to the here and now, but lift up your heart and set your eyes on heaven. And remember the promise of Scripture that these present struggles are not worth comparing with the glory that awaits us God's answer to human suffering always has been the promise of heaven there's something else we can learn and this will be my last one and I'll be quiet every rescue is a reason to celebrate did your heart not rejoice as you watched the people rescued this week did your heart not rejoice were you not made happy I saw one rescue, I bet you saw it too, on television of a, of a man who had to be in his mid-80s. In the early service, I said older man in his mid-80s. They had several people in their 80s to say, that's not old, so I'm not going to say that anymore. <laughs> one man in his mid-80s, he, so, he was hunched over, he was frail. It looked like he had a walker. I couldn't tell because he was most of himself, most of his body was underwater. And a couple of these young guys climbed out of the boat, these, these redneck heroes, <laughs> bearded, wearing camouflage, and they climbed down in the water with him. And I thought, how in the world are they going to get that guy up in the boat? But they did. They did. Took a lot of grunting and groaning, and you thought the old fellow was going to fall apart, but they got him up into the boat. And I just wanted to stand up and cheer. And when I thought about those rescues, I thought, that's how Jesus feels. That's how Jesus feels. Not just when he sees people rescued from a flood, but when he sees people rescued from sin. Amen. You see, there's a promise that heaven rejoices every time that one sinner turns to God. And what you and I experienced as we saw people rescued from the water is what heaven experiences when heaven sees people rescued from the devil and from sin there's a chapter in Luke chapter 15 go ahead I never know whether to tell you to stop clapping or start clapping I don't know Luke chapter 15 is full of stories three wonderful stories of what was lost and then found first there's a lost sheep then there's a lost coin then there's a lost son you remember the chapter 
And when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he gets excited. He gets celebrative. And when he finds it, he happily puts the sheep on his shoulders and goes home. When the housewife finds the lost coin, she says, be happy with me because I have found the coin that was lost. And when the father, the prodigal son, explains to the reluctant older brother the reason for the party, he said, we had to celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. The point is clear. Jesus is made happy when the lost are found. Heaven celebrates when those who need to be rescued are rescued. He says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. Excuse me. When one sinner changes his heart and life. This is interesting, isn't it? The Bible says nothing about a party in heaven when we get married or when we graduate from high school or when we get a new job. The The party doesn't happen then. I guess the bubbly stays in the refrigerator. But it comes out and the cork is popped and the stringers are strung when one person places his or her soul in the hands of God. Why all this celebration? Why does heaven celebrate when a sinner is saved? Could it be? Could it be that heaven can see what we cannot? When one sinner is saved, heaven can see the kind of person that sinner is now going to be. Did you know that when you're in heaven, when you're escorted into your next life a wonderful transformation is going to occur you're finally going to be glorified you're going to be changed that last form last step of transformation is going to happen heaven is going to be heavenly because you're going to be heavenly the scripture says this about what you're going to be we have not yet been shown what we will be in the future but we know that when christ comes again what we will be like you're going to be like Jesus. Isn't that something? Now you can clap for that. How many of you are tired of how you are now? Don't you get tired of how you are? I like me, but sometimes I get tired of me. I get tired of being cranky. I get tired of being grumpy. I get tired of having doubts. I'm tired of being resentful or having regrets. I just get tired of that. A heart gets heavy. The promise of heaven is that the day is coming when you will be just like Christ. You will be just like Christ. That final transformation is going to occur, and you're going to be just like Christ. You're going to have the joy of Christ. You're going to have the wisdom of Christ. You're going to have the hope of Christ. You're going to have the heartfelt worship of Christ. You're going to have the understanding of Christ. I can't wait to see you in your new you version. You're going to be something else. Heaven is going to be heavenly because you're going to be heavenly. You're going to be something else, something to behold. That's why heaven celebrates. That's why heaven celebrates when a person says yes to Christ because they know that that person is on the road of transformation and that final transformation will happen when they step into the presence of Christ. Heaven also celebrates not just because you will be who you were made to be, but this, you will enjoy the world as it was intended to be. That verse one more time. The whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Our world is experiencing a rash of birth pains. It is not to me to know the day or the hour that the Lord will return. But I cannot find one prophecy that has not been fulfilled. I cannot find one thing upon which we need to wait, one more event that needs to happen, another page of history that needs to turn. It seems to me that these rash, this rash of birth pangs are coming at such frequency that we could keep one eye on the eastern sky because that Christ, the promise of Christ is, could very well be fulfilled in our lifetime he could return harvey reminds us harvey reminds us that the world was not made to endure these storms but that this world is third trimester heavy and we're getting closer and closer and closer to the final delivery and our role is to do what they teach you to do in lama's classes breathe deeply and hold the hand of the one who loves you Just take a deep breath 
In one of his final sermons, Jesus told us to expect an increase of natural calamities toward the end. He said that. And then he said in Matthew chapter 24 and 6, see to it that you're not alarmed. (laughs) And he uses a Greek word here that means freak out. (laughs) He says, see to it that you don't freak out. You can be concerned. You can be on alert. Uh, You can be aware, but just don't freak out because we know that Jesus was the Lord before the storm. He's the Lord in the storm, and he'll be the Lord after the storm. Amen? Amen? So we place our trust in him. Jesus promised that bad things will happen, but they will not happen forever. The day is coming in which you will be changed. The day is coming in which this world will be changed. And to that day, we look, and on that day, We set our hope. I want to make sure. I want to make sure with this stormy reminder all around us that if you have never said yes to Christ, can I be sure and urge you to do just that? Have you not been reminded that none of us are guaranteed tomorrow? None of us are sure of what's going to happen. We act like we do, but none of us do really know. What we do know is that Christ Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and he rose on the third day, and that he has ascended to the right hand of God, and there he oversees the affairs of mankind in the Trinitarian God who takes care of us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has promised to return and to redeem those who say yes to him. But he leaves that choice up to you. If you have never said yes to him, or if you're not sure you have said yes to him, then I urge it with all that is within me. Say yes. Just say yes. And he will do for you what rescuers have been doing all week. He will pluck you out of the storm, and he will keep you safe. Many, many years ago, after Hurricane Katrina, I attended a a citywide church service at Antioch Baptist Church. The pastor that spoke that night, Pastor L.A. Williams, gave a message on one verse. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I remember he challenged us to imagine what Noah could see as he rode on the ark and looked around, and all he could see was water. He couldn't find his farm. He couldn't find his town. He couldn't find any buildings, but what mattered most is that Noah had already found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's the first appearance of the word grace in the whole Bible, and it had to do with a flood. Have you found grace? Grace is the word the Bible uses for unmerited favor, the kindness of God. Noah found grace, and though he may have lost everything, what he had still mattered because he found grace. May you find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Please be reminded of the message of this storm. Possessions don't matter, but people do. It's community that keeps us together. Every rescue is worth rejoicing. And this world is not working right, but the next one will. Heavenly Father, we thank you for messages that encourage us and that lift us up. Would you, O Heavenly Father, be our teacher and help us to process this in the way that glorifies your name, that comforts all of the church and all of your followers, and helps us to see that you're up to something really, really special. Through Christ we pray. Amen.